Welcome to another episode of the Scenario Remix. We are back. We are back. My brother Matt, how you doing? Good, man. Hey, we've been on this. Uh, we've been on this marathon this week, man. I mean, we didn't. We 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 getting that content out. <laughs> yeah, man. We look, look, man. We had we we got we had uh, Cam Jansen on last. We had Keith. We had Adonis on. We we didn't we didn't have some celebrities. We got another celebrity with us tonight too. Right? Let's look at. <laughs> <laughs> my homie man rob desire anchor in richmond uh man thank you for coming on man he's been on the, the podcast before this dude actually if people remember he's the one that put me on dom kennedy i don't know if you remember you put me on dom kennedy yeah you man me, I, you know that I, I, <laughs> yeah <laughs> The president, Dude, I've been, the, president, the president of the summer for, for, yeah, for several yeah. years. <laughs> Dude, you know how much I've been downloading all this stuff. I went to go see him in L.A., dude, like 2012, somewhere around there. I just happened uh, to be in L.A. for work. And I went, I was like, I saw, I went online, Dom Kennedy, <laughs> I'm going. Right. Yo, that, 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 that song still knocks. Still yeah. Knocks. <laughs> but Rob, man, uh, thank you for coming on, man. Man, glad to be here, man. Glad you invited me back after like 13 years, man. You know what I'm <laughs> <laughs> I had to go around the sun. I'm like a Haley's Comet to get on, you know, this podcast, <laughs> Oh, man. So let's start out from the beginning, man. Uh, you grew up upstate New York, right outside New York, uh, yeah, White Plains, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Actually, Rockland County is, is where I'm from originally. Um, so grew up there, went to school there, and then obviously went off to school uh, to college. You know, I'm all about the U University of Miami. Got to represent. And then my family ended up moving there down there, South Florida, while I was in college. And then that's where nice. Oh, so of your family moved while you were already in school. They I was like, yeah, well, I was in college. You know, while I was at the U. Uh, my mom ended up moving down there, but it was probably my junior year. And then um, so she ended up moving to South Florida and. You know, all my siblings, you know, cousins, you know, my dad now lives in, in Florida as well. He was in Port St. Lucie. Uh, so, like I said, parents, you know, siblings, uh, cousins. I got, like I said, 90, 90 to 95 percent of my family's in South Florida now. So, you know, they've been there for like the last 20 plus years, 25 years. So, yeah, that's what it is. But, you know, you can't forget where you're originally from. But, you know, home now to me is South Florida, aside from being living here in Virginia. Now let me ask you though, and this is saying this is something this is something I love to ask everybody from up in New York area is what are your teams? Like what what teams do you rock with? Because it feels to me like there's a lot of different ways that that comes together. And how how does what's well, the dividing it, line? I mean, like how's that work? For folks you? who live in in New York, you know, like most people who are uh, are Jets fans or Mets fans. If you're a Giants fan, you're a Yankees fan. Like that's a whole situ a whole association. Most people obviously rock with the Knicks in New York, but for me, I'm 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 one team and one team only when it comes to New York, and that's the Jets. I'm a diehard Jets fan. I've been a Jets fan since Richard Todd was the quarterback. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I go down to I go down. To, I'm down with Wesley Walker. I'm down with Freeman McNeil. I'm down with Mark Gastineau. I'm down with Joe Klecko. I'm down with all of them. <laughs> <laughs> you really in the you in the weeds? You know. Al Toon. What you know about Al Toon? <laughs> how you feel about how you feel, feel about Sam Darnold? How's he doing you so far? I think I think Sam is doing okay. I mean, I, I I'm not mad. You know, I think once we put some weapons around him, like last season, we didn't have no weapons for the Jets. And first off, I didn't even think the Jets was gonna win seven games. Jets you know? cost so me some money. I didn't last think year. they were gonna do that Jets, well. Jets Jets cost me some money I thought, last year. I thought I thought they were gonna go like three and thirteen, like you know they did, you know, the previous seasons. You know, I was surprised they, and then I thought it was gonna win five games max, but they won seven. And then now, you know, the, the whole division opened up because Brady's gone. So I'm like, yeah. you know, we might actually, you know, we might actually win eight games. So I guess one of the, one of the dope things about being down there in, in, in South Florida, though, is that you're still, you know, what well, well, the time you spent down there is that you still got a chance to be close enough to your squad, you know, going through the Dolphins and whatnot. Yeah, and, and, I, and I hate the Dolphins. I hate the Dolphins. <laughs> I hate, I hate, yeah, pretty much. I'm not a Miami professional franchise fan of anything you know he even when they was winning i didn't care i'm i'm so i'm so all over the place because when it comes to the nba i'm a golden state fan and i was golden state way before they started winning we're run tmc we're run tmc 
and then you know when everybody when everybody started to get on the bandwagon they're like ah what's your connection i'm like dude i just always love them you know so whatever but those are my three teams you know i rock with the jets i rock with the warriors and i rock with the U. that's it I, so, feel like so, Ken, I feel like I feel like we're kindred spirits, though, because I'm a 49ers fan and I've been in Missouri my whole life. You know what I'm uh, saying? But it's like when you connect with a squad, that's your squad. And you ain't got to explain right. it as long as you can really share some real pain from <laughs> back in yonder days. And, and you got that. You got that if you was an old school Warriors fan and an old school Jets fan. You just have yeah. bad years in general. Right? Yeah. Well, I've only seen I've seen the I've only seen the the Warriors win a championship. The Jets have not won a Super Bowl in my lifetime. They won <laughs> one, but it was before I was born. True. But before I, everybody was born. <laughs> but like, but if you're a real Jets fan, like every Jets fan says, it's like next year is our year. Next year, yeah. we're like we're like Cubs fans before they won. You know what I'm saying? But like yeah. next year is our year. But I wish you better than I wish them, but that's a whole nother And actually, you know what, man? Oh, and oh, since he oh, mentioned oh, that, oh. I think the flashpoint paradox may have happened then. Hey, I'm gonna tell you, man. All right, so, so Rob, <laughs> I'm gonna tell you, this is a conversation me and Daryl been having. I've been reminding a lot of people about this, is that I don't know if you're hip to like comic book lore or anything like that, but there's a thing called the flashpoint paradox, where the flash ran so fast in recent time, everything was weird as hell. There's a lot more to it. So I'm gonna tell you, the Jets might, this might really be the year. <laughs> Because everything is, because let's look at what doesn't make sense anymore. Tom Brady is a Tampa Bay Buccaneer. <laughs> <laughs> the Kansas City Chiefs won the Super Bowl. And look at all the other things we talked about. We the Blues Super won Bowl. the Stanley Cup. The Blues won the Stanley Cup. The Cubs won the World Series. Even if you just stick in the NFL, a, a, a backup red, red shirt uh, quarterback won the Heisman and is now the number one pick. Like, there's a lot of weird stuff going on. So this might be the Jets' year, man. You never know. But it really would have helped if they would have drafted, like, C.D. Lamb or something like that and gave, and gave Darnold something to do from the outside. Hey, man, from your mouth to God's ears, I hope he's listening. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, Rob, how did you end up down at the U, man? <clears throat> man, it's crazy because <clears throat> I used to, growing up in New York, my, my school was always, I wanted to go to Syracuse, man. I wanted to go to the Q's. When I was a kid, you couldn't tell me because I loved. You got Derek Coleman in there. You got Derek Coleman in there. All them dads, you know, I used to love them, man. So, and then that was my dream school. All through high school, that was my dream school. But, you know, I'll, I'll make a long story short. I didn't get in, which like broke my heart. Uh, um, but I had backup schools, um, and uh, I, it was down to the U or Temple. So, um, so I was going to choose between those two schools. So that I remember taking a trip. Uh, a high school visiting trip and uh, it was snowing when I left it was like February to go take this trip or March whatever it was like these uh, visiting trips so when I left New York it was snowing when I touched down in Miami it was 85 degrees <laughs> so, that, so that was like I was like damn I went from night to day and then I got on the campus and I saw what they was working with and I was like oh they was like going to school you know just bikini tops you know Daisy Duke shorts and then in a book bag and I said I'm going here. <laughs> so you, and that's you, crazy because Miami is a private school, right? Private school. It's a and private Syracuse school. didn't let you in, but Miami, let, that's a, that's a. It, it, yo, you know, it, you know, I don't even know what it happened. I don't know what happened. I remember that crushed my dreams. So because that's day, a state school. Syracuse is a state school. The state school Syracuse, of New York. Syracuse is a state school. Well, it, yeah, Syracuse is a state school, I believe. Yeah, but um, it didn't work, but it worked out for the best, man. Because yeah. I love my alma mater. You couldn't tell me. <laughs> I, I, I ended up going to what I think is the greatest school out there, you know, but uh, I had fun. I still support. I still show love. I still got, shoot, I still got everything you gear. My, my, my license plate still got Miami on it. So, so I still got a Florida uh, license plate because I use my mom's address. <laughs> just because hey, you want to have a Florida hey, plate. Hey, just to be, hey, that's just one to one be like inside, that. That's one of the inside, uh, inside the, uh, the game of plays right there. I know a whole lot of cats a guy from Florida they ain't got a house down there. Right. It's the way to do it through the uh, CO2 and if you check engine light as long as you fail automatically and if you light oh man I remember all those days. Property taxes on your car Missouri. Come on son. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, you reminded me of all the things I owe money on so I appreciate yeah, it. What's so crazy is that Matt because uh, you just paid your uh, tags right like didn't you like have like a long stretch where you did not have tags? Yes. I, it, it, it's called a, it's called a peaceful protest. So um <laughs> So I, I bought a car, brand new 2017, in 2017, and I got the tags like right before the quarantine started. <laughs> so that's what happened. So like I decided to finally get into the game. I get how did you how did you extend it out like that for three I just years? Didn't, I just didn't pay it. I just drove. Like I just drove. <laughs> the 
the car. I didn't care. I paid for the car. The hey. laws are stupid. And if the law doesn't make sense, I'm not participating in it. So you just had the temp tags on there? No, I just had the 2017 tags on there. And I just <laughs> drove very swiftly and got to where I needed to get. So that's neither here nor there. That's neither here nor there. I needed some Florida plates. We'd have got there. Um, I, so I'm, I'm curious. So like when you landed down in, in, in Miami, what what point in time was Miami in, like, for Miami? Like, what was happening? Like, what was, like, the, the, the culture that you landed in for? Okay, so when I got there, they uh, – I got there – I was at the U from 90 – I got there in 93. So, they had just won the national championship two years prior. But okay. it was actually on the decline. It was it was a crazy time for football. Um, when I was there, my freshman year, the seniors there, like, The Rock was there. He was still playing. He was a senior. Warren Sapp was there. Um, so they, they were like all seniors, but that was also my freshman year, a crazy year because, um, I don't know if you guys remember this, but a player was murdered on campus, uh, my freshman year. No, 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 and no. That, Go that, to this. that was the same year, uh, my sophomore, my freshman year, I believe too, was when Sports Illustrated put out that, uh, that magazine cover, why University of Miami should, uh, uh, dismantle football. If you go back, there was a huge article by Sports Illustrated. So it was crazy. And there was a whole Pell Grant scandal while I was there. Um, they started. They started to be bad, like seriously. And I so think, this is when they had all that talent, but they couldn't get over the hump a little bit. Like you got Ray Lewis, all of them. It was oh, Ray Lewis was my, in my freshman class. So me and me and Ray were in the same year. We actually had class together. We had we were in a, a theater class together. He was a, he was crazy. He was funny as hell, man. And you know, obviously, he went on to do great things. Is now a Hall of Famer. So that's great to see. But yeah, we we had talent. But it was like we could never get over the hump. Like they would have, I think my freshman year, I think they went 10 and three, if, if my memory serves correct. But then the next couple of years, they were always like that nine, 10 win season. They weren't never in the hunt for the national championship kind of thing like they were before. And then they went down. It wasn't until after I graduated, they went back up like in 2001 when they won the national championship when they had everybody on that squad like probably the greatest football team ever, college football team ever assembled, the 2001 Miami Hurricanes. I, I dare anybody to tell me there was a better team throughout history than the 2001 Hurricanes because we had like 13 guys that went in the first, 11 guys that went in the first round of the draft that, that season. Um, and I think we had 16 guys total drafted from that team. So it was crazy uh, after I left the court. So you weren't there when the, uh, when the one dude was, uh, that was doing the Ponzi scheme stuff was uh, put throwing that money at the players. You, it was like right after you then. What was his name? No, the, uh, no. the little short guy. No, no, that was after. That was after. Yeah, but the Ponzi, I was there, the, I was there during the Pell Grant scandal. And obviously with the murder and, you know, we had. We so had, what was the situation with the murder? What was the situation with the murder? Player was killed by somebody who was off campus. Um, it was like some kind of situation he went on campus. One of the players, I believe, was, uh, you know, some kind of with a girl kind of thing. Dude got mad, went on camp. It was a crazy day. I still remember that. Well, you, you know, and the, th and the thing I'll say about the U, it's funny that, you know, you bring that up. I think we lost oh, okay. I lost sound there for a second. I'm sorry. Um, but the thing about the U, it's funny you bring that up in the times that we talk about stuff in here today. Because I... You know, I mean, I was aware of it when it was going on, like, back in the 80s and whatnot with it. I mean, you know, just knowing sports history and whatnot. But, like, I feel like the U doesn't get all the credit it's deserved for being, like, a, a, a program that just puts black image forward in sports. Like, you know, you know that, like, the Fab Five did, you know, and they got it up on the court. But I feel like the U is the first, like, real in-your-face, hey, we out here, we going to be us type of football program. And that legacy has really got spread in some ways that I don't think is rooted back to them like it should. Well, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe not if I agree with that completely, because I think the U still has, has like this, this kind of uh, this essence of this kind of thing when people think about it, because when you think about ESPN, I mean, they did two, you know, uh, 30 for 30 on them. Like what other. Right, and, I, and I think that that was the wake up point, you know, got that we got part one part two and then we also have another 30 for 30 but notre dame catholics versus convicts yeah. you know what i'm saying so you know everybody loves the whole mystique of of miami you know what i'm saying i know people can say oh they haven't won in 20 years and blah 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 i get it but people still you know love to see them when when they're good people watch you know what i'm saying it's still it's still a brand that people know i i i know we're all caught up in clemson and alabama these days but shoot i think Miami gets back in that national picture, everybody would love to see that.
I feel like Miami and Notre Dame is like the Lakers and the Celtics for black versus white people when it comes to college football. Like, still. Like, you hear, I hear, Notre Dame's won one title in my lifetime, but I still hear all this stuff about Notre Dame and all of that. But I think for black folks, the U represents for them on the other side of that equation against, like, what Notre Dame stands for. I hate Notre Dame. I can tell you, I can give you a list of schools that I hate when I'm telling you. And my, my best for Notre Dame is up there with Florida State and Ohio State. Because, you know, Ohio State is out of a national championship. So is that, is that when the beef started? Is that, is that, is that beef starting in 2 That Mo, the Maurice Claret when they yeah. used an eligible player in the 2002 national championship? Yeah. <laughs> I still remember that vividly. And then, you know, the referee who called that pass interference when Miami actually won the game, when we found out that that ref actually was an Ohio State graduate, so he was refing the game of his alma mater. That still messes me up to this day, son. And it's also, and it's also, that's one of the worst Ohio State teams ever, too, to win, to, to win anything. They should have never, they should have never been any, even in the game. I mean, who and, else, who else is on that squad that was dope? What, Chris Gamble's like the best player, right? That's probably one pro, right? Uh, probably. I mean, like I said, anybody who's Ohio State, I don't mess with them. Uh oh, uh oh, we gotta, we gotta get you on. You, you met Big O, you know Big O. I know, oh, I used to mess with him too, man. I, 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 <laughs> Orlando, man, he used to come on the show when I was doing the shows too back there, man. So I, I love Orlando. He might be the only uh, Buckeye <laughs> to uh, you know, go somewhere. Because we do a show with him, the OG Hour, man. Uh, we do a show with him. <laughs> Time you see him. Yeah. I'm actually, I'm actually, I'm actually, uh, I'm actually gonna break, do my second quarantine break, and stop by his place tomorrow. So I'll be sure to send. Uh, I'll grab the clip and, and send it for him just to let you know. Yeah, yeah. So. so after after Miami, man, what made you decide to want to get into journalism and be a being a, a, a anchor and and that and that side of media, or man, just a media period? I, yeah, man. When I was a kid, I always wanted to do it, man. I always tell people the story. I I knew that I wanted to be involved in television journalism, sports anchor. When I was like, I, even though I switched to news now, but like since I was eight years old, I remember because. My dad used to have us watch the news all the time during dinner because we actually had a TV like in our kitchen, like like kind of like elevated, like it was like up the on the wall. So it was mounted on the wall. So my dad used to love to watch the news while we'd have dinner and the sports would come on. And uh, I just always remember whenever they were talking about the sports, I used to, I didn't know how packages worked and how you know, somebody was talking and the video was matching the words at the same time. I, I was eight. I didn't know. But then slowly but surely, I found out that these guys go to football games and basketball games and hockey games for free. And I was like, what? Like, yeah. <laughs> oh. And then like, yeah, when you're at the game, they feed you too. And I was hooked. That, that's how simple I was at eight. Free <laughs> like, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. So then, so after, after that, so you go there, did you go to, to Miami for journalism or what did you? I yeah, studied uh, broadcast journalism there. Yeah. So I studied broadcast journalism, did, you know, and internships were, were really big, you know, so I was fortunate. I did an internship at CNN in Atlanta. Uh, that was during the Olympics, the 96 Olympics when the whole. Oh, so you know, no, that was when it was cracking. So you was there freak Nick. Yeah, that was during 96, the Centennial Park, when the whole bomb happened and everything. I was just leaving CNN when that thing happened. Then the following year, I did an internship at ESPN, so I went up to Bristol. Uh, so that was an experience. Got to see all the anchors and, you know, see how that worked and then did the local internship. So, no, you, so you was down there at Freak Nick then in Atlanta then? I, you know what? It's crazy. I, I'm so disappointed in saying this. I should lie, but I can't. But I <laughs> actually experienced a Freak Nick personally. When I was in college, um, I never took that trip because one year I was going to go, but I had this, uh, I was seeing this girl at the time and she was begging me not to go with my boys. Because <laughs> it was freak Nick. <laughs> homies is going, please don't go. And I, I was like, whatever. You know, I was, I was, I was simple. And I was like, all right, fellas. <laughs> she told me not to go. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what, that, was, that was your freaking story that you almost went. <laughs> I, I almost went. I was like, I, I seen it on TV. I, you know, I used to watch them late night hours and get those when people that had the, the home cameras and bring it back on campus. Like, yeah, no, <laughs> before the cell phone videos. Just yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And you got to think somebody had to put money into that with the camera to have the the the, the camcorders. Somebody had some little paper to do that. They had the camcorders. Oh my goodness! I, everybody was just throwing it back, watching the videos like thirty times. <laughs> so then. Um, 
you so after after you leave uh, after you graduate what was your next steps in like getting into the industry like you had these internships then what was your first step into uh, like jumping into the pond like so after school uh I, I took a little while to find a job but my first tv job was as a morning sports anchor which is crazy morning sports and i went to mobile alabama so i did that <laughs> And it was cra- it was it was crazy because I had never been to Alabama prior to uh, getting the job, uh, but I spent about 15, 16 months there, and it was it was a great experience for me because I got on TV a lot in the morning because morning shows about two hours, two and a half hours, so I had to do something every half hour, so it was a lot of runs for me, which I needed, you know, to gain that experience. But it was like waking up at two in the morning, which was was not fun, <laughs> yeah, you know. And then I kind of had split shifts where I had to come back in the afternoon to go work on a story, that kind of stuff. So that's how I did that for a while. And then um, then I moved to Indianapolis and that was a different kind of experience because now I'm working with a professional sports teams, which is what I wanted to do. So I'm covering the Pacers and I'm covering, you know, the so who's on the Pacers then? Is this Reggie Miller time? Reggie Miller, Chris Mullen, um, uh, Mark Jackson was playing there. Uh, so is Larry Bird's the coach then? Larry Bird was the coach. Uh, yeah, I was there when, when the Pacers uh, 2001 finals against the Lakers with Kobe and Shaq when they won their first championship. So I was, I, I was there for that. Uh, Peyton Manning obviously was a quarterback with the Colts back then. He had, you know, it was like uh, Marvin Harrison uh, and Edron James was there. So I remember him from the U, so he was there. Um, there was a lot of people, man. So I was there. I, I, I worked in Indianapolis for a couple of years. And then obviously after that, came to St. Louis, worked there for a grip. And there were so many things that happened during that time. Got to see, you know, the Cardinals win a World Series. Obviously, you know, the Rams. Rams, I had moved there after the Rams had just won that 2001 Super Bowl. And then after that, you know, they didn't work out. No, we, we got Mark Bulger. <laughs> after you moved, you wasn't bad. You know what I'm saying? You know, they did a lot worse. Mark wasn't bad until Mark just got hit too much. I mean, just the things just didn't work out for him good in the long term. But so you moved to St. Louis, like at the like really close. Oh, the, to precipice. the other side of the, peak of, the, of the town at that point, right? Uh, as, yeah, I mean, there, there was still the greatest show on turf. They were still there, but you know, like I said, they had just won that Super Bowl, and, right. and 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 they were still together. And they thought that obviously this was maybe going to be some kind of dynasty that was going to happen. So, but, uh, so you were there right after this, the second Super Bowl against the Patriots, or you were there right before that? I, but what's 01? 02. 02 is that two bowl. The one they lost, right? That's yeah. the one they lost. That's when I came. Because they lost in February, or whatever it was, January, February. And I started, I moved to St. Louis in March of 2002. So it was right after that. So you moved there, right? So it was already like, oh, we, we, we here. We good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yep. so you were for, for the for the run where the Cardinals went to the World Series two times in three years and you know got over the hump and all of that. On the field when they won that first one, what was that? When they first just moved to New Bush, New Bush, Bush oh, three, six. right? Oh six, yeah. Uh, oh, I was there and I remember, man, like it was crazy because they were playing Detroit. So I was on that whole run, that whole playoff run. I went with them to because like they started out. I think their D, uh, division series was against the Padres. It was the Padres mm-hmm. that year. And then it was the Mets, and then it was the it was the Tigers. Yeah, yeah. And taking all those trips, and that was that was a that was fun to cover. That was fun to cover. So, so well, like, I, through, go ahead, man. Go ahead, D, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead, man. No, no, I'm I'm just. So I was just gonna ask you, you know, like already, you know, early in your career like that, you've seen a whole lot of different things, you know, a lot of different experiences like that. But for you, you know, ranging from the Olympics all the way to World Series and things like that, what's been like your the event that you covered that's like meant the most to you that's like that thing that's a memorable experience oh, man. well i can say like obviously covering a, a world series and coming from me and i was never really a baseball fan until i learned to i, I learned to appreciate baseball having living having lived in st louis because obviously you know people there love the cards the, the redbirds they think it's you know baseball heaven you know all that other stuff so i learned to appreciate baseball more and i I learned so much more about the game being around those guys in particular. Um, so that was a fun experience. I, but honestly, I got to tell you, the, the thing that I loved most was college basketball. And I'll tell you one time, I think one of the best things to cover for me was 05 when the final four was in St. Louis and Illinois was on that run. Mm. Oh, man, bro. That was one of the most fun. Like Darren Williams, um, they had um, D Brown, Brown, Luther um, head, Luther head. That, whoever that, that he was coaching. That was one of the most fun things that I ever covered because I'll tell you one thing, because um, what was it? 
I think it was the um, Elite Eight game when they were playing Arizona in Chicago. It was at DePaul. And What's Salim Stoudemire? What's Salim Stoudemire? Oh, my God, son. That was like <laughs> – they were down so much, and they came back and won that game. And I was, I was there because they were playing um, at DePaul, DePaul Stadium uh, um, Arena. At the and Rosemount, I, the Rosemount. Yeah, they were at Rosemont. Yeah, I remember that game so vividly, man. That was, like, one of the greatest games I saw, like, with my own two eyes and the energy. That was so fun. And, obviously, they came to St. Louis, but they lost to North Carolina, who had a crazy squad. <laughs> but that was fun just to see that whole how that whole Final Four worked. Uh, to me, like, it is, the outcome wasn't what I wanted because it would have been more fun for Illinois to win it, but it was still a great experience. Is that your biggest sports uh, incident being in, in general? Like, what is your biggest sports coverage that you had to cover? Like, some of the, like, event that you're like, yo, this was, like, the shit. I've, I've, I've been fortunate enough to be around a lot of things. Like, I can, I'm just trying to think, like, in other markets. Like, when I was in Indianapolis, I remember being there the day Bobby Knight got fired. So, I remember having to drive. Oh. Ooh, that was a huge deal. Wow. <laughs> Man, I remember, I remember that. That was crazy. Um, so many things, obviously. Um, I remember even in Indianapolis, my first day on the job in Indianapolis, you know, was uh, I had to go cover. Uh, it was a Lakers Pacers preview. So it was my first day there. And I had to go cover the Lakers practice. And the first two people I, had, I got to interview were Kobe and Shaq. And I was like, wow, this is a way to start the job. <laughs> you know? So just little things that I'm just thinking about like, like that and you know, just traveling, you know, going to a lot of things. Uh, you know, when we were with the when I was in St. Louis covering the Rams, traveling with the team was was cool. You know, flying on, on the team charter was a new experience for me. I had never done I didn't even know that was possible. Now, question before you even go further, did you get involved in the gambling situations that were going on in these planes? Nah, 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 nah. Because you know where anyway, at least where they had us sit back then. I don't know how it works now if they still do that, but you know, media would sit all the way, like the last three rows. Like, think about it. You just take a regular, like a regular commercial flight. They would just take it and charter it. And, you know, you're just sitting, the seating chart just works in a way where coaches sit in the front, players sit by, I guess, hierarchy or who's more popular or whatever. Media is in those last three rows by the back. <laughs> so you don't in tight while all those other middle seats are empty. Media, y'all cramped in for a long flight. You're like, oh, God, you know, I got to do this four-hour flight. Where are we going? Seattle. You're like, damn. <laughs> it's a damn. <laughs> so after St. Louis, what was, so what was your path to get to where you are now in Richmond after seeing St. Louis? So, so after St. Louis, man, it, it was crazy, man. It's like it's, it was a wild time for me because, you know, um, I was there in St. Louis and things didn't work out. Uh, my contract actually wasn't renewed, and so I was, like, out there trying to uh, I stayed there for a little while trying to figure out what was going to go on and then I ended up moving back home I uh, went back to South Florida for a little bit trying to figure out what I wanted to do and I just kept pursuing I, I thought I wanted to stay in sports because that's all I knew that's all that's all I did and then uh, finally I opened my mind and started doing news and which I didn't think I would ever do but then news opportunities I saw a lot more news opportunities than I did sports and then out of the blue, uh, you know, the station that I work at now in Richmond, you know, they called me and they said, hey, we, would you be interested in doing a, a, a news anchor position? And I was like, yeah, sure. So I did it. And it's been so different, but it's been so uh, rewarding at the same time because it's opened my mind. And, you know, just knowing that obviously while my life revolved around sports, I know sports isn't the only thing going on in the world. <laughs> mm -hmm. So right. That's a good thing. And, and I feel like I get to uh, touch a lot more people and give information that affects a lot more people as well. So my, my question for you in, in that is obviously it's an interesting time to take that turn, you know, to say interest is probably underselling it as far as I can, you know, so being able to be on the news desk during a time like this, like what's been that experience for you and being able to see just the, stream of, of different topics that are coming in that you're having to decide well, to do. We, we, we're all living in some crazy times, but I think... <laughs> we call it the flashpoint paradox, the flashpoint paradox. But I think that this is one of those moments where, you know, me being on the new side, know, knowing that I can give out information to a lot more people who are depending on getting updates on whatever's going on topics like 
you know, two, two, three months ago, we were all just COVID. Everything was just COVID, COVID. Everything you did was COVID, you know what I'm saying? And I feel like I was part of, uh, of a team that was giving out information to people that needed to be updated on what's going on in their community. So it, it, it's like, you know, we have a platform where we can help so many people. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, doing that, I feel like was really good. And then now we're on this whole, you know, protest and, you know, standing up for, you know, you know, Black Lives Matter and, you know, police brutality. And this is another thing, so, so, so we're covering. And then even here in Richmond, there's happening like protests, you know, people are just fighting. And then out here we have, uh, you know, Confederate statues out here, which is a huge thing. And then now they're, they're talking about removing them. And it's just, it's just so crazy what's happening here. Um, so yeah, just, just having the tool that, that we all have with a podcast or radio or TV that we could uh, touch so many people, I think is such an important thing that, that we do and we have to be really careful and really informative now, now more so than ever. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I agree. So like, you know, with, with, with that though, you know, I mean, there's obviously there's so much going on with that. I mean, every day it's kind of like a new horizon almost. It feels like how quickly things are developing, but you know, one place that's not been, you know, exempt from this has been the sporting world. I think that you started to see so many things that have built into that. So now we're kind of at a convergence of the two worlds that you lived in, both with the news, the general news and things like that, but also with how it's impacting the sporting world. So with, and, and I guess COVID as well. I mean, obviously we're still not out of the woods with COVID. It's just not the number two thing, uh, number one thing on everything right now. Um, what have been your thoughts on the sport in the world though? And like how many different blows it's taken this year as, as it's trying to figure out where it fits into the big picture of things? Man, I mean, I know everybody's crying because right now we should probably be watching the NBA Finals at this point of our lives. I mean, you know, we should be in like game one or game two of the NBA Finals, whoever, mm. whoever going to be playing in it. That's where we are. But I think, you know, obviously COVID has to, uh, you know, we, we didn't know, you know, as a whole how serious this, uh, this disease was. So everything had to be put on pause. And I know a lot of people are disappointed about baseball not starting. You know, we don't have basketball playoffs, but we don't know. And, you know, people were getting sick and people were dying because of this. So we had to shut it down. And I, me personally, I still think that we're still getting a little too lax, you know, with what's going on. I know people are out there protesting, but there's not a lot of practice in social distancing, air <laughs> math. And I'm like, you know what, everybody's talking about, like, there's going to be a second wave. I'm like, we're, we're not going to get out the first wave because <laughs> you know, this, this thing right here, I mean, I know it's a movement, but I think we're, a lot of people are forgetting about COVID. It's still there. It yeah. is still <laughs> So um, now I know what, what would really hurt me is if there was no football come fall, but I can understand why. <laughs> but shoot. Man, I don't know, man. I mean, sports, sports is such so important to so many people, you know. But if if we don't do it because we're we're trying to keep people alive, I understand that because people are like, oh, we can have football, but we're not gonna have fans in the stands, you know. And they're like, oh, that doesn't make any sense. I'm like, it does make sense. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You want six thousand people, you know, basically serving as a petri dish, and you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, well, thank you. And look, I mean, I'm, I'm a soccer guy, so, like, the Bundesliga has come back up, and, like, they start pumping in the sound. You can't tell no difference, honestly. Like, with the sound, as a fan, it's like, if you're watching from TV, you can't tell the difference. And shout What's out going to whoever, on? who's ever controlling the sound of these games, because when it gets really close, yeah. it's like, yeah, oh, it, it goes with, it's just not one long sound. They, like, change it by what's going on. Like, if it's a corner kick, like, oh, like, oh, like, oh. Well, and I think they benefited from some of the early attempts to have live sporting events because what was it? It's been, like, three months now since, like, WrestleMania, and that was just weird. I was just, like, pro wrestling without fans at it is really strange. It's like, it's like um, community theater on steroids, maybe literally. But, um, you know, they Put some CGI effects and just put a crowd in there. Make something. Everybody... Well, see, and until so that goes to a story that we had on the uh, show a couple of weeks ago, where some people did try to do some artificial fans, but it didn't quite work out the way that it the was Korean, supposed. the Korean uh, 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 league with That's the dolls. Yeah. 
I heard about that. Hey. <laughs> That's not the way. But, uh, but you know, but one thing I, I did, I don't know if you got a chance to see it. I think that the UFC has really done a good job of showing how you can have sports be similar. you got to shoot it a little differently and go about it. But, you know, you still have the environment. And once you get into it, you really don't notice, from TV at least, how much of a difference it is in, in, in things like that. Yeah, I, I think that you can definitely be creative. I mean, modern technology, we can do so many things, man. So, like, whether they uh, put some fake stand, fake fans in the stands or just add the audio for, for the noise effect, I mean, we, we can do it. It's just making sure those people are safe because especially when you talk about football or, you know, basketball, you know, basketball is a little different because you got 12 guys, but still those 12 guys got families they go home to and, you mm -hmm. know, Everything is six degrees of separation. So, and when you talk about football, you got about you know fifty three man roster, practice squad. You you talking about like eighty guys working around each other every day. And then when they go on the road, you're you're you know you're, you're tackling somebody you don't even know what they've been doing all week. You know yeah. who. So it, it's gonna get real tricky. It's gonna get real tricky for football. Yeah, I think that the mental the mental hold that that's going to take, I think it's underrated too. Because I mean, those guys that's that's in those guys' heads, you know. I know that even going to the grocery store right now, like I sit there and think about, you know, man, what's this mean? What's this? You know, I got to be careful. I got to wipe it down. So let alone being at the point. I always wondered this. I wondered, like, could the NFL come up with a new helmet, like a motorcycle helmet, so that way they're not breathing on each other or something? That maybe that I'd might be out there in a Darth Vader costume if I had to be. If you hear me breathing from 25 yards away. Hey, man, give them some kind of some kind of gas mask or something. Yeah, it, it, it's a tough spot. So, but I, I wanted to, you know, speaking of the NFL, man, you know, obviously, you know, when we have racial turmoil or anything of that, the NFL is obviously not going to be too far away from the. Uh, from the, from the center of that pretty soon. And, you know, of all people to step into the middle of this, Drew Brees does, you know. And <laughs> Shout out to Drew Brees. I, it just, it's, it's just been a, a really weird thing to do. So I just, I just want to throw this out here, and, you know, and everybody kind of throw their thoughts in. What, what was Drew thinking he, when he says that in knowing the world that he's in and knowing the sport that he plays? Like, what, is, what, what compels you to do that kind of as a catalyst in this whole situation? Shoot, I, th I think Drew think just thought he was saying something that was, you know, poignant to the moment when it really wasn't where he kind of like went off topic. I think well, I, I think I saw I think it was Shannon uh, Sharp said something how, uh, you know, we're talking about, you know, a certain issue, but somebody else wants to flip it and talk about other issues and not address the issue that's at hand. Mm -hmm. like. That's not that's not what we're talking about right now. We're talking about, you know, this. And you don't really want to address it. You want to talk about some other stuff. And, you know, he just brought it up. It had nothing to do with the conversation. And now, now he's looking, like, real silly. I think, to me, the thing that really stood out about it is that that might have been the type of thing. And, and this is a measure and stick thing I'll put out there. Is that that might have been the type of just a stance that you could have taken a year ago and not caught as much heat. But to say that right now... For me, that really ended up being a litmus test for how serious people are about every aspect of this right now. Like, either you're in or you're out. Like, there's no middle ground to it. And to me, the thing that really stood out was is that I, I get up early pretty much every morning, period. But, like, Drew Brees apology. I got up at 6.10 that morning or something like that. And Drew Brees' apology woke up with me. It's like, <laughs> if you go out, you run early in the morning, and you see the other people on the street and you're just like oh hey what's up you i see you out here like his apology was out at like 6 15 and that's when you know already that you done messed up you got to get out there like drew Brees was apologizing to like a dude that had broke up with his girl and was trying to get back with her like right away only it was his girl was millions of people around the entire country <laughs> yeah yeah and and the other thing too is i was i was actually i've thought about this for the longest time ever since the whole cap thing and you know how we talk about the, the the national anthem, how it played such a part in the, the movement and what Cap was stand, was kneeling for. And I wondered like now more than ever, because I thought about this three years ago, but like I wonder now, would the league consider 
not playing the national anthem before games now anymore. Yo. Like, because I'm like, you know, because it started because it was a money thing from, from, from jump anyway, because they didn't used to do it, and then they did it, and now because Cap was making a stance, they made it even more of a deal, not forgetting that they didn't do it before. So I feel like, what if they don't play it at all anymore? Like, I feel, hey, listen, Rob, I tell you what, I was literally <laughs> just thinking that myself. Like, I had a whole big status built out on Facebook, but I was just like, I don't feel like dealing with it right now. So I didn't do it. But to me, oh. yeah, absolutely. I think that the national anthem is like a nostalgic thing that people do just because you do it at sporting events. But never before in history have leagues been less American, and I say that to say you have more people from more places that aren't represented by that national anthem. Like, for example, at a Major League Baseball game, you need to be playing the Dominican national anthem damn near more than you need to be playing the, 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 the Star Spangled Banner. Like, but, like, does it still have a place? And I don't think so. I don't think it's important. I think that you can erase all of this by just saying, you know what, this isn't worth it. However, the other side of that, and, and Daryl, with you being the blackest person I know, I want for you to, <laughs> Here we go. to speak into this too, uh, that, that also some people might say that if you take it out now, you take away a chance for people to make that cultural stance at, at a game, and that could be seen as a league just trying to remove itself from the, uh, from, from the frying pan that is that discussion. So have we, because of the fact that we've made it such a big thing now, can we be done with it? Or is it now just something that is used as a pedestal no more? I'm trying to think. So it's, it's me being the blackest person, you know, is, is the king of the blacks. Yes, um, yes, is, uh, shout out to Howard Stern, the actual king of the blacks on Howard Stern show. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm getting less and less blacker, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> as the days go by. <laughs> You're not. You're not at all, but please continue. <laughs> no, I'm just saying when I say this. Um, I think of all this stuff that's going on, period, with the, with the flag, with Cap, Drew Brees, this is an overall black statement. I don't trust none of them. I don't trust none of these folks that, that's, that went down at the beginning. I don't trust none of them. And that's, 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 my, and that's maybe the blackest thing I sell on this show in a long time. Is that this I don't trust none of, of the rare, This might be one of the rare times where I'm actually blacker than you. And, <laughs> and, and, and I don't want no apologies because apologies are becoming I don't trust trendy. none of them, no. I don't trust none of them with it. So apologies are becoming trendy. And people mm -hmm. apologize. I feel like Drew Brees has, like, unconsciously made himself to be, like, the mobilization of this in sports. Like, he's become the person now that people are going after. Because it brings me to another point that, uh, Rob, that we had mentioned before we got on the air, just kind of chatting things up. But now, I think talk about three years ago a big difference now is is that the players are actually going out themselves and saying things and there's a support for things that are happening now because it's a much greater crossover cultural situation that they weren't saying before which makes me think you know it cap has cap now finally like everything that happened with him has it now come to fruition is this a big payoff of of the stance that he took now happening since now it's mobilizing more players to say things than might have done if he hadn't have said what he did or did what he did in the first place. Oh yeah, absolutely. I definitely, I definitely believe that. I mean, with, the, with any movement, it always takes one person and people don't realize what he's doing. And a lot of times until years later, you know what I'm saying? It's mm -hmm. like, <clears throat> you gotta, you gotta be, you gotta suffer the consequences now so people can reap the benefits later. So I think like now everybody is starting to, you know, the folks who are totally against what Cap did, they're like, oh, you know what? Maybe I kind of get it. I kind of get it now. But it's just like, yeah, but you, you don't get it still. You know what I'm saying? It's like people are, you know, and, you know, maybe nothing is ever too late, but I think a lot of things sometimes are too late. Like, you know, like the whole Rod, you know, Goodell's apology, we was wrong and blah, blah, blah. Like, I don't know. If, I'm not buying it. <laughs> like, no. I was like, I don't trust them. It's like, come on, you know, like, but, you know, in that whole apology, I don't believe he mentioned Kaepernick's name once. You know what I'm saying? Oh, that's my thing. Yeah. yeah. So it's just like, so, like, what are you apologizing for? Like, we should have listened. Well, why didn't you say we should have listened to Cap? You know what I'm saying? 
let me let me let me help. I, I can explain that situation. I, I can see this right. I can see exactly what that is. Roger Goodell gave the ultimate fuckboy apology of all time. Ooh. Where everybody's <laughs> stuck in the house, everybody's feeling the type of way, and now he's gonna hit you up. Like I heard this was happening with a lot of women and maybe some dudes this was happening to too. Not my life, thank God, because it would cause a lot of problems and how that's set up. But ever since the quarantine started, you have had some of them exes that have been popping back in, like, hey, I can see how you're doing. You know, just wanted to, you know, to say, hey, I'm feeling a different type of way. These times have really made me kind of think about things, how it happened between <laughs> us. And I just want to say, oh, I'm sorry. That's Roger Goodell. And fuck that, Roger. I'm not listening to that. That, that is a fuckboy apology that he came up with uh, uh, just because everybody else was apologizing to see if he can get back in the good with it. Hey, Roger Goodell would have to come on TV with some Paul Kanai on with a uh, with, <laughs> with, with chicken and, and, and an entire check written to the Know Your Rights camp. It's his year's salary. You know what? Yeah, I think it does. But here's the problem. I don't want Cap to play now. It's been four years. I mean, and this isn't, and, and I don't want him to come back and then justify people being like, oh, see, he wasn't that good. We did all of this for that. I don't want anything to drag down the fact how that brother left the game and the circumstances that he did. And I also don't want anybody's pity fuck either, where you're just like, all right, come on in. You know, it's cool. Come on back. It's, it's, it's good. You can play. I don't want that. Like, they very well could open the door, but now I feel like there's guys that like take. Cam Newton, for example, who doesn't have a team right now. Now, to move him back and to give a seat to the cap ahead of another brother that's not getting a job, to me, that really says it's a ceremonial thing and we're doing it just to do it. Well, wait, and to me, say that, but what about the, the 50 or 75 quarterbacks, the bums they got off the street that they signed who had been, who had not played football for years <laughs> before you right. even cap a, a, a look. And I agree. And you know what, Rob, if we was having this conversation and this event was happening two years ago, I would feel super passionate about cap playing because I would feel like at that point in time, I'd be like, yeah, this is still going to move it forward. I'd have a lot more of those Ali coming back from the, from the, from the, the Vietnam. So is this Mike Tyson coming out of jail point? for you? This is Mike Tyson coming out of jail for you? No, because Mike Tyson came out of jail and was still knocking cats out. But there was yeah. some bums. He, he, fought, he fought some bums, though, on the way oh, to yeah. that. <laughs> For warm-ups. Yeah, I mean, the, the Peter McNeely's and that type of stuff had to happen. But also, and, and, and I'll admit in any second, I could be wrong in his stance. Maybe Cap does need to play. Maybe he needs to come back and do it. I don't want, when we had a chance to bring him back last year, when he went out and did what he did, showed he could do, and it still, for some reason, wasn't good enough, and the league set up all of those hurdles for him coming back put them now just to all remove them. And then we create some white hero who signs him to a contract. And now they reap all the benefits of selling all the jerseys that they definitely removed from the back. I just don't, I just am very skeptical about him being, being used as a chess piece in this fake NFL Paris scenario. It's valid. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I, I mean, I don't think people need to say like, oh, Cap needs to play like, but there needs to be some kind of goodwill for him. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I want him to play. I could feel mad on that. But at the same time, I do kind of want him to play like somewhere like in New Orleans, like to be the backup there and like take over for Tays uh, Hil Taysen Hillsome or whatever. But the, Jameis the, Winston is there. No, I want to take Jameis, Jameis yeah. Yeah, that's, Jameis. I mean, I mean, Jameis can go. He can go get some crabs legs from somewhere else, though, man. He'll nah, Jameis, Jameis done got LASIK surgery at his eyes. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> he ain't throwing no more INTs. He's ready, son. 30 30 Jameis, baby. His vision 30 30 last right. year. He tried to get it down to 2020 this year. Uh, that's that's the next 30 30. <laughs> Jameis Winston. It's Jameis Winston's vision. <laughs> it, it's a, it's a, it's a really complicated. <laughs> it's a really complicated thing, man. I mean, and it's um, and 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 I don't know if there's one way. Obviously, I would never be against Cap having a job and being out there and playing. I Ivan, mean, I would love it. I just wonder if I, I I really feel skeptical about them now coming back to him and doing it. I honestly, one thing we've really gotten good at as a people, I think, is speaking for Cap and what he wants. You know, we got to make sure Cap even wants to do it at this point. Still, <laughs> who knows? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's a good question. But I, um, I wouldn't be surprised if you don't want that check. <laughs> it's a nice one. It's a nice one. I tell you what, bring Cap back 
give him um give him Drew Brees contract, swap those roles. We could do like trading places like Eddie Murphy but, uh, with <laughs> Drew Brees and, and Colin Kaepernick, and I'll be down. He'll all the way in for sure. <laughs> what New Orleans? I mean, I mean, New Orleans at this point could do that, and they'd be the blackest city ever if that happened. They would certainly have. They would, they would certainly have a, the love of the black people, unlike very few places have. <laughs> because they're going to what Taysom Taysom Kaysen or Taysom Hill or whatever it is after that. Taysom Hill is like there. He's like he's kind of like I, what's the position I would I would use for him? Um, an X factor kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so, but you can't play in New Orleans, though. You can't have a Mormon play in New Orleans. It's Catholic. You can't do that. It's Catholic man, black people there. You can't do that. Man, I, they, shoot, you, you could say they got them all. They got everything in New Orleans. They got voodoo. You know what I'm saying? So No, no, no. But I'm just saying, though, the best thing for them marketing-wise, they ain't going to win no championship. But if they did sign Cap, I'm getting into well, my I'm, black conspiracy bag. They could sell merch out the ass. <laughs> Oh, yeah, they, they definitely could, you know what I'm saying? But they got Jameis. Like I said, he got the new surgery. You know, <laughs> you know he, I'm surprised you're talking so well about a Florida State person like this. No, 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 I, I trust me. You know me. I, I don't, that, like I said, I don't mess with nobody. My brother went to FSU. Half the time of the year, I don't talk to him. So, you know, <laughs> so uh, yeah. So, so no, but, since well, mentioned hey, the Florida hey, State. But, hey, but we're forgetting a big part of this, though. If if Colin Kaepernick did go to the New Orleans Saints, he would have to take Taysom Hill's jersey because they both wear the same number. So oh, yeah. all about this. Yeah. Yeah, I'm Taysom, all about that. <laughs> he'd have to give up. He'd have to give up the seven. I don't yes. care. I don't care if, if Cap gets signed. I don't care where he goes. Whoever's wearing seven, and I'm trying to think of any elite quarterbacks right now in the league who wear seven. I can't think of one. But even if there was one, He'd have to give it up. Yo, if Cap signed with the Broncos, he should wear seven. I don't oh, care. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah El, but Elway, <laughs> you know, Elway lied about talking about giving him a contract in Denver. We know that never even happened. So he ain't, he ain't going to Denver. That's for sure. Elway was, Elway was fronting. Big Elway was front, no, Elway front, And then Elway tried to put this, this, this thing like, oh, I need to listen. This, this whole message. Some of, these, some of these teams trip me out. Like Elway with his message. Goodell with his message. You know, when was it earlier this week when everybody was – was posting the uh, the blackout uh, mm-hmm. posts on social media, and I saw Washington, you know, put that on their team. You know, the NFL. <laughs> but your team is the Redskins. I'm like, I'm like, Washington posted a blackout. I was like, that's kind of like an oxymoron. They got the racist, the most racist nickname for a team out there, and they're gonna talk about Black Lives Matter. So that that <laughs> but that just tripped my mind out. They in DC, the, you the, know, the Washington, the Washington football team's racism quotient is the highest of any sport team between Daniel Snyder. <laughs> Between Daniel Snyder and between the, the name of that team, there's no bullshit that's higher. Like, they clearly that social media post. That was somebody who ever runs their social media site. He, that person did that. that yeah, was, and there's somebody that, black. That it was somebody black. That, it was somebody, yeah. somebody black. Yeah, that, that so, was – So, and mentioning uh, people that are uh, lying, uh, Norvell at the Florida State uh, just blatantly lied <laughs> that he oh. told his – talked to his players. <laughs> We're going to give you room here, Rob. Rob, you take this. Make some room for you. I'm going to pour myself a drink and just let you go. I'll be back. <laughs> Uh-oh, he didn't brought the you out. <laughs> okay, now let's talk. Now let's talk. Okay. Which, which... So – I, I thought Willie Ta- they did Willie Tiger bad though. I think they were doing real bad. They didn't give him time at all. Uh, yeah, but I, I, you know what? I I question first off why Willie wanted the job. I know why Willie wanted the job because he didn't want to be out there in the Northwest. He didn't want to be out in Oregon, even though he had a bomb team. Yeah. He didn't want, I, I don't know why he wanted to leave the Pac-12 when he had a really good squad. But he was at UCF. Was it UCF or USF? No, he's at USF. USF. He was at South Florida, and he had yep. built that, then went to Oregon, then went to FSU. And he just, man, he he, <laughs> he was just at a bad time because uh, them quarterbacks were trash. But I they said him. all the players respected him and really liked him. Like, yo, like. You know, it's one thing being a player's coach, but if you're not getting results on the field, it doesn't matter what kind of coach you are. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Bob, Bobby Baldwin, when he was a coach, he didn't know half his players' names. <laughs> 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 he didn't know half these get over here <laughs> <laughs> number three well so i mean but i think that you know that's a good call out though because sometimes sometimes that player's coach player's coach is like kind of like the moniker that's the cousin of he's a good game manager like don't give me that either call me a good coach or don't call me at all because that can fool around and get you ushered up out of there 
But, you know, I thought it was, you know, that's a good call out, though, about, you know, what happened with, a, with, with Norvell down there, because it made him re. It, the funny thing about that explanation was he says, that, all right, I actually text everybody. But he gets called out by uh, by, 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 by Marvin Wilson, who's going to be a top 10 pick next year, who's like literally like stepping up to the plate being like, nah, man, that didn't happen. And like the thing I'm starting to see a lot of that you didn't see at a lot of levels before is these college players are calling out these coaches for how they're acting and doing things. And one thing I've seen is a lot of lines that get drawn to Kaepernick and what's happening now. But, um, you know, when you go back even further than that, look at the walkout that happened at Mizzou. You know, mm-hmm. there are a lot of people that were very critical of the players and the things that happened there during the uh, during the, the racial uprising there. I mean, and I'm not saying this simply just because I'm a Mizzou alum, but yeah, that you are. Team, that team, <laughs> well, so so for uh, time out real quick. So for what Florida State is to you, Mizzou is that for Daryl. So we'll just. I, 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 <laughs> that's not but, true. Um, that's not true. That's not true. But, uh, but he he left the state and then turned his nose up at it after he left <laughs> for college. But um, but you know, but. He, but even then, it was unheard of for college players to be doing what they were doing now. And now you've got, you know, people at Ole Miss and South Florida, they're taking, they're doing walks and things like that and mobilizing what's there. Players are calling out coaches. Like, I think that the group breeze and things like that can always get the big piece of the news. Michael Jordan putting the money up that he did can get the big piece of the news and things like that. But when you start to see how deep it's getting into the culture of just saying, like, listen, we're not just going to be athletes. We're not going to just fall in line all the way to the point where college kids are doing it. To me, that shows the real difference that's happening in the last week compared to where things were at before. Yeah, no, I mean, it, I'm glad to see these young cats doing their thing right now because <clears throat> this is just one of those moments in time that they have to capitalize on this moment and, and show that they're, they're, they're not going to sit idly by, you know, like they, they have the power to change so many things right now, like with the NCAA, with professional sports, man, this moment right now is really going to let us know what's going to happen for the next decade, man. Like so many things can change right now. If these cats all, you know, band together and, and link up like with these coaches, you know, Norvell Lyon, like Florida state always does. Yeah. Know. Cause he said, because he said something <laughs> about like gold chains, like no gold chains, no gold teeth. Um, <laughs> no do rags. Oh, it was some crazy like. <laughs> wait, North Bell, Wait, where did where did he come from? Memphis, 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 Memphis. Right, yeah, he came from Memphis, but that's one of the blackest cities ever. So that's why I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Memphis, like the, the the cats on his squad wasn't rocking gold and do rags. And Memphis, come on, son. You know I, they I, were. I, I know, I know. Norvell seen hustle and flow. Yeah, you know <laughs> he had to watch it at least twice. I mean, come on, man. Like, people I don't know are, what people, he's doing. People that are going to Memphis were born with gold teeth and do-rags on. It's just <laughs> oh, the way that they showed up. Nah, they know they know, they know, know all that. They know some barbecue. And they know the jazz music. And they know how to get down. You know what I'm saying? They they had to listen to, uh, you know, 8-Ball and MJ, MJG at least once. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Young Dolph, somebody. <laughs> Project yeah. Pat is from Memphis, man. Come on now. I mean, it's just the way that it is. All them cats. <laughs> So, so why do you feel – why is your disdain for Florida State lie? Why do you think they lie so much? Why, what is the, the thing about them lying so much? I mean, they – everything about Florida State is trash, dog. <laughs> well, I, I, don't even know, I don't even know why we have this conversation. You know, you know I got the hat on. So you yeah, know no, I, I mean, look, I have nothing – I have no dog in the fight. I'm just saying. <laughs> he say that every time he got a dog in the fight. So, there it is. <laughs> No, I don't. The dog I in know. the fight is chaos. He about to jump in and just say he liked the Gators for a second just to see how it do you. <laughs> no, nah, I'm not a good Florida player. <laughs> no. It's all good. It's a, like I said, it, it's good to have rivalries. I, I, yeah, I, oh, most definitely, man. I'm a big fan of rivalries. I remember, you know, you know, in, for Matt, he said from Mizzou, Illinois, you know, you know, the uh, the, bas- the the shootout that used to happen uh, inside mm-hmm. the dome every year. Edward Jones, though, that was fun to watch, man. It, Seeing them cats battle was always fun to watch, man. And we finally got both of our rivalries back. We've got the Kansas game coming back <laughs> on basketball and football. We got uh, – they're working on getting the football game back for Illinois Mizzou, which used to really rock down at the No, dome. that was popping. That was popping but, uh, down and, at the and bragging rights And bragging rights, you know, which, uh, which, which, which we got. So, yeah, I mean, you got to have rivalries, you know what I mean? But, you know, at the end of the day, it works out. Now, I'm going to ask you real quick because I'm asking everybody about this because it's been the cultural event of the quarantine. Uh, last dance. What are, what are your thoughts on the last dance? And uh, you know, just getting to kind of go back to that because that's you know that's a heyday right there for my generation. Yeah, 
Yeah, I thought I thought it was uh, really well done. I mean, ten parts, and the fact that nobody had any real sports to watch. Everybody <laughs> was so focused every Sunday night. It was just like, leave me alone. Last dance is on. Don't call. Blah blah blah. Everybody was like that for like five weeks straight. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that that was a cool thing. It was interesting to note that as these uh, episodes came out, the people who were part of it who didn't like what was said or how it was edited or this was a lie, this wasn't true, and blah, 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 all these things coming out. That was interesting to know. Like, I knew Mike was on another level, but all these people didn't like the way they were portrayed. Like, Horace yeah. Grant, I'm going to punch Mike in the face now. You know what I'm saying? That's crazy, That's crazy. you know? It's, I mean, it's, Mike is the one that greenlit, greenlit all this because I think he was the last one to be able to give the footage away. Like Mike has the last word on everything because it's Mike. But, like, you know, if Horace Grant was like, nah, it wasn't it, – the way you guys edited, edited my comments – wasn't really true, you know what I'm saying? You know, it's just like the way they did, you know, what's funny to me is how they did some of these people so dirty. Like when they did Gary Payton, Gary's like, yeah, man, all I do is you just, had, you know, just, just, just get in his face. And you know that conversation was an hour with Gary Payton and they took out two they minutes. Mike's <laughs> Mike's uh, thing like this, he's like, <laughs> <laughs> Gary Payton don't know Jack, you know what I'm saying? Like, no, you know, that, it's just funny the way they did people so dirty. The one like, person I wanted to interview was Craig Hodges. Why didn't they interview Craig Hodges? Craig, Craig was like, yeah, Craig, yeah, I don't know why they didn't get on Craig. Because you know he came, he came to the White House in a dashiki. Yeah. <laughs> well, the funny, you know, the funny thing is, I'm writing, I'm writing an, I got an article assigned to me uh, yesterday about just doing. I got an open-ended number, which I hardly ever get when you get build media when they give you when limits are on everything these days. Don't go past this. Do that. Of, about listing activist athletes of any, you know, of any ilk and just writing different captions about it. And like, I'm looking at like- Craig Hodges. Oh Craig yeah, Hodges. Well, Craig Hodges is definitely in there. And um, he gave good George Bush a note. He's one of the lost activists for the thing. It would have been interesting to see how he would have fit into the flow of that. Damn, uh, of those it, 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 it's D, you know, another cat we used to be D, D. What was old boy name? Mabdu Arouf? Yeah, Mahmoud Abdul Rauf. yeah. Chris Jackson. A Chris Jackson, yeah. yeah. It, it, he was like before there was cap. It was Chris Jackson, man. Yeah, you know, that when he and all he did was pretty much pray during yeah. the national. He didn't sit it out. He was praying, losing his mind. And he was still giving it to cats in the big three though uh, last year. Like he was still putting up buckets. Oh, that's one thing that gets forgot about Mahmoud Abdul Rauf when he was at LSU. He was a murderer. And keep it that oh, it was him and Shaq together. Yeah. Yeah, he was a beast. Like he he's the second, he's he's the second best. He's one of the greatest guards in SEC history. I think he's second in scoring in LSU history, and that's only because Pete Maravich was there. So I mean, like, and, and, and <laughs> that's, that's, that's insane. Hey, Rob, I want to ask you this, man, before we um before before we get out of here, because I know that this is something that I, I got some thoughts about. So I'm really curious to hear yours. Um, you know. I think it's pretty regular to hear things where people criticize the media's hand and things. You know, the media's doing this, the media's doing that, you know, said <clears> things like that. But you made a great point earlier saying, you know, that you take a lot of pride in being able to be that conduit for people and get the message to them, you know, especially when we're talking about things with COVID and things like that. But, you know, during these times when we have all these different things going on, but especially right now with the uprising and, and what we have as far as what I pretty much labeled to be a, a Right now, at least, being a, a progressive civil war, which could become a lot more in 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 in, in short term. Um, how do you feel about the, the voice of being an African American in media and being a person that is responsible for putting that word out there about you know the role that you play in that and being able to really say what's in your heart, but still doing you know doing your job too because you still have a job to do at, at the same time. Yeah, man, uh, it's a good question, bro. Uh, I mean, I think, and you know this as well as I do, the first thing we have to be sure is that we're presenting facts. So once we get past the facts, then I think we as uh, black people in media have, uh, I guess, I don't know, maybe a pass is the word I want to use, but maybe uh, this is our moment where we can inflect certain things that people may not be aware of while presenting the facts. You know, it's just like, we can open more minds and eyes now more than ever because people are looking at us during these situations wondering, oh, I wonder how Matt feels about it. I wonder how Like Darryl a little bit more feels. anecdotal, like a lot yeah. more anecdotal. You, you can really just, you know, drop something on them um, now more than ever. Just, <clears throat> but we have to be really careful. Like, don't get caught up in, we, we can't get caught up in, 
you know, somebody saying something and be like, yeah, we need to uh, uh, add that to um, our, our pieces or our stories because this is what we're really angry at. I should say this. We can't come across angry, but we have to show that we are frustrated while presenting the facts, but giving to it, staying real, and just letting people know that above anything else, yeah, we're black men, and yeah. this is how I feel about the situation. You know, I, I saw a meme, and I think this, this is one of the greatest memes I've seen to, to, through this whole protest, and uh, it was just like, you know, it's, it's not like a media thing directed to your question, but it was like, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, but it said something like, uh, I think it was like, uh, white people should be, uh, uh, I forgot how it goes, something about white people should be happy that black people are only asking for equality and not revenge. <laughs> I was like, whoa. <laughs> whoa. <laughs> I was like, you should be happy that all we're asking for is equality and not revenge. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. That's a hell of a, yeah, yeah, that's a hell of a way to look at it. That, that, that's real. <laughs> That's, I don't know if you got a chance to see it, if either of y'all got a chance to see it, but I think that you just highlighted something that I watched yesterday on ESPN, uh, where on, uh, uh, what is it, First Take, um, at Maria Taylor was on. And yeah, she called out Breeze, right? Yes, and she, and she just flat out just, she explained it so eloquently, but I think that I know that she did it in a restrained way. Like, every time she opened her mouth, she was like, I got to be careful what I say next, because I can make a point or I can change the whole trajectory of my career. Mm -hmm. And she walked the line so perfectly that she got the message out of being tired, of saying that we're tired of the same result coming back and that we're not going to sit back and just allow this to continue to happen. And for me, I looked at that and I was like, that's strong. And I was telling my fiance about this, where I said is that she looked at her before she talked. She did all of the context clues for us as black people we knew it was getting ready to be a scene right quick, <laughs> but we know that she was trying to still do what she needed to do to get her point across. And I think that that's a really important point that you just made, saying that we need to take the platforms that we have and make sure that our points land. Got to make sure that your points land, because otherwise, I kind of look at it like gymnastics. You can do all the crazy flips and stuff in the air that you wanted to, but if you don't stick the landing, people aren't going to remember all the great things that you just did or said before that. And I think and, sticking that landing is really important for us in media right now. Right. And it, it, it was just like, and you know, we can't like as much information as out there when you're using your platform, like when you're writing something, if you just write something, if there's just one sentence in whatever you write, however long that article is, if that resonates with people, that's what they're going to remember, man. So it's just like, say something like you're like, boom, you're like, Oh, smack. Yeah, that's true. And like everything else just opens somebody's mind. Like you just they're just blown. They're like, wow, I never looked at it like that. Or I never thought about it like that. So like as you're writing, you know, you just gotta do what you feel, you know, don't force it. Cause mm -hmm. whatever is gonna come out and it's gonna, you know, you're a professional, you've been doing it for, for a while, so you know what you're doing. But like if you can put something in there that makes somebody go, Oh, smack, that is true. That's that's all you need, man. This is this is the time that people are, are paying more attention. So when you put something in there, it got some sauce. People are like, "Damn, I felt that. I felt that." And I, I think that on the other side of you know being in front of the camera the way that you are is, is that being able to have that visualization of you know. And it, I hate that it is this way, but it just is of being a collected, smart, articulate, well put together brother who's saying what it is that needs to be said. That's a tool as well. You know what I mean? And that's something that, unfortunately, to some people, they look at as being the exception when it's really the rule. But we still got to, I think we got to be great at taking the blows that we're going to take, which are what we're fighting against right now. It's those mm -hmm. blows, and those assumptions where you have to say, oh, it was a peaceful protest. Like, what the hell? Hey, like, oh, my God. Oh, you, you just said that. Man, all this week, all these scripts that I'm reading, everything is a premise with peaceful. I'm like, why are we saying peaceful? in front of protests. When it's looting and rioting, why don't we just say that? Why do we have, always have to premise protest with peaceful? I hate doing that. I really do. And I think that some of that is that exceptionalism, where people that write that stuff and look at those things, look at it because they expect it to be something else, because they look at what's involved. And then they take those words and put those words in front of people like you. And it's like, well, wait a minute now. Before we go reading this, hey, let's look make it clear on what this is. But with me, like, and people know me here, man, like, I, I, 
I sometimes have a tendency to not hold my tongue. Like I said that actually on the air. I was like, and I was like, look, I know we're saying peaceful protest and I hate that we have to say peaceful in front of protest because people <laughs> should automatically assume that every protest is peaceful. It's not peaceful or not peaceful. But not because because we're we're singling out, you know, every you know, TV is one thing, like media is one thing. The one small bad thing is that show something bad then that's the whole example for everything that's bad you know what i'm right. saying so if it's one small incident then we got to highlight that incident and go well you know 95 percent of these things are good but then there's these five that are bad and you're like well why are we focusing on the five percent that are bad you know what i'm saying but that's what we do because it draws an audience yeah and i think that those are some of the things we're fighting against in perceptions right now is, is that that perception of exceptionalism has to stop where it's just like when black people do something that's not what you expect it's it's an exception or something like that and that's not the case and that goes back to the point about hey all we're saying is call it down the middle not get right what you got wrong in the past even though bob johnson came out and said that that total for reparations is about 14 trillion dollars <laughs> and then brought out that big long list of where other, other people have received they come up and and we haven't gotten a dollar yet so we could we could fight that but like what i say right now is let's get this fight to get people's eyes open and while we got people's eyes open let's let let them take a look at what we really know that we are and, yeah, and, and that and then a feeling at that point is by any means necessary oh wow okay my uh, man so i yeah, know you you're the blackest person on this show right now uh, Matt, <laughs> i told um, you every once in a while my 75 overtakes my 25 <laughs> most of the time most of the time i sit at about a, a 90 percent my 10 percent being what i learned from the points that rob was just making about hey man listen you can really say what you think but sometimes you got to make sure that your words are decipherable by everybody <laughs> right no but i think but again man i mean we are in a position where we can really really have some impactful you know moments or statements or things that we can do can, that can really resonate with a whole lot of people because especially you know, especially in St. Louis now, because obviously, you know, with, with Mike Brown six years ago, and I, I just saw that. Because uh, you, yeah, you left right before right Mike Brown. You left right before Mike Brown. I, yeah, I left right before Mike Brown. So there was Mike Brown, everything in Ferguson. Now Ferguson just elected the, the, the female mayor. Yeah. You know, it's like all these people are paying attention to all of this stuff. So everything is coming back with, you know, with Mike Brown now. And then obviously, you know, you know, rest in peace, the, the police officer at, at the Lee Jewelers. Yeah, the, yeah Lee Brown's and Jewelers, right? yeah. Um, so, so that, that, that's crazy. But like now, like people are just watching all of us, you know, TV, media, uh, you know, print, you know, social media, all of that stuff. Everybody who has a voice, they're, they're, they want to see what you got to say, what you're doing, man. So like, you got to use that, man. You got to, you got to like, really like show like, Hey, look, you know, we got something to say. And while I may not be the, I know I'm not the most eloquent, eloquent speaker out there. I know sometimes I can say something when I want to say it, if I'm really passionate about it, I feel like I can make an impact. And we can, and we can, and we all can. And I think that that's the thing that we all have to stop and use and look at every platform we've got and look at it more critically than we might have in the past. I mean, I think that, I think President Obama's address earlier this week where, you know, he just took it upon himself to say, yeah, maybe it's not usually the place that a president comes in, a past president, I should say, comes in, but I got a platform, I have a responsibility, and I need to do this. And I think he used that time amazingly well to get a lot of message out that wasn't just about him. But it's just, those are the type of things that, you know, that, that I look at. I say, how many different ways can I meet, reach how many different people? And how many different messages can we get out in that time? And I think that that's what we've tried to do with this show over the last mm -hmm. two weeks, is get to as many different platforms, as many different people, in as many different areas as can speak as possible and realize all the ways that we can leverage what we need to do through that. Yeah, that's great, man. Like you guys get them all, get black, white, Hispanic, mm -hmm. you know, everything, man. You know, get that whole rainbow, man. Baskin Robbins, 32 flavors, whatever it is, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Rob, where, where, where can everybody hit you up at, man? Where can they follow you, check you oh, out? Oh, man, so you guys can <laughs> follow me uh, on my social media pages, all Rob underscore Desir, same thing. Uh, Facebook is just Rob Desir. Uh, I think there's a fan page too through my job. Yeah, so yeah. It's my <laughs> fan name. page through your job, so you don't even run that, basically, you're saying. No, 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 no. It's mine, but like, I, like it's so weird. Like, I have a bunch of, I have two Facebook pages for, for one's for work and then there's a fan page because it made it transfer over. Either way, if you look at my, <laughs> you'll find it. But, um, but like Twitter and uh, Instagram, it's Rob underscore Desir. So that's how you can do it. 
Well, man, I, I, I hope that we can get back into this fall, man, and we can get back to some of the things we talked about. We can get this college football. We can get back in this league. Rob, you're in the soccer, right, Rob? You're in the soccer, right? Soccer. Yeah, I mean, I watch it. I, I, I'm not like – I can't break down every player on every team, but, like, I do follow a little bit of, you know, the Bundesliga and La Liga. And, you know, I watch a little bit of that and EPL. You know what I'm saying? So Yeah. Because we're trying to get mad at team, man. Mind. We have a whole thing of the next few months we're going to get mad at team because he, he's uh, he, he, uh, us, a couple of our homeboys, we, we, a, lot of, a lot of us are EPL fans, and he, he feels uh, left out. So he's trying to figure I out his team. I don't feel left out because I don't watch it. But I'm like, but I feel like, but everybody's like, they want me to be a part of it. And I'm like, I have to cover so many sports. It's hard for me to just pick another one to be. I'm telling you, man, it'll, you get hooked in, man. And you'll but, be but up on Saturday thing. morning. But, but that's what I'm saying. During these times right now where, where, Things are just up in the air. I have more time to pick teams, so I'm gonna get one. I'll, I'll watch it. I'm gonna get the video game. I'm sure that won't make my. I'm sure that won't make my my, my fiance happy. But I'll play it. I'll learn players that way, and then I'll go. <laughs> yeah, don't get on no bandwagon. Don't be like I'm Manchester City or Manchester United. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait, hold on. Stop it, stop it. What are we? Hold on. I'm a Manchester United dude. Ain't no ban. Ain't no bandwagon. I'm a, no I'm United. I ain't no you city. Fuck a city, oh. man. I ain't no city, man. Come on, man. <laughs> Feel some type of way to. I mean, either, oh, way, no, it goes, man. either way it goes, I gotta be a. I gotta. I gotta be a distance fan. I'm used to that. Again, 49ers, Carolina, <laughs> you know, all of that. Hey, hey man. man, we can. We can. Hey, yeah, hey, you hey, come back on. The, 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 the Jets and Niners play each other this year. Well, hopefully, hopefully we can we can get it in. First of all, first and foremost. Sure. By the way, because my wife's a Niners fan too, because she's from California. Oh man. So yeah, we think about going to see that game. Well, hopefully you can go, first of all. Hopefully that, that happens. Um, you know, the Niners are playing the Cowboys this year, and I sure had that yeah. on my calendar of things I wanted to go do. But hopefully it happens. You know, we'll see what we look like. You know, I feel like y'all is a team that's on the come up. And again, past point paradox, man. This could be our year, bro. We hey, never know. Got, I'm hoping for at least 500 seasons. I'll be happy with that. You should wow, get that. 500. I, I, think should get wow. that. I think you should get that. I think you should get that. So you, say, so you, say you, got a rookie, you got a rookie quarterback in Miami. You got a, a a quarterback from West Virginia in North in, in, in New England, and then you got the the, the the Bills. Bills are the only team you really gotta look at and figure out. Bills, now Miami the bills, are, bills are only worth. I'm only worried about the Bills now. New England, Miami, Miami finished the year in a good place. They 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 definitely almost ruined their chances to get to, to get Tua that they needed to get, but that's gonna be a whole process. So y'all are one of those teams that's in the position that can have a get that you know capitalize on the situation. So. Eight wins, baby. Eight wins. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> hey, eight wins, and the Warriors are going to be in the top three of the draft with eight, a lot of good guys coming back. It could be a great year get, for you, man. We're about to get the number one pick in the draft for the Warriors. Uh, we call it the Steve Fisher. We call it the Steve Fisher, the uh, the eight and eight. You know what I'm saying? Uh, the, the, the fitty fitty. You just want the fitty fitty. That's all you want is just fitty fitty. Yeah, man. Not Steve Fisher, Jeff Fisher. I'm sorry, Jeff Fisher. I'm sorry. I'm just yeah, I'm just, yeah, Jeff yeah, Fisher. Tennis. That's all he did. Five hundred, eight and eight every year. Eight and eight, baby. That's all you said. You just want the Jeff Fisher. I'm hey just man, Jeff to... Fisher. Jeff Fisher is the poster boy for C's get degrees. I'm <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Rob, for coming on, man. We appreciate Fellas, it, man. man. It was fun, man. I'm glad I got to uh, see you again, D. It's been a long time. Yeah, man. yeah, I'm yeah, fun. man. We, you definitely, man. I, I, I man. I, well, next time I come out to DC area, man, I might have to drive down there, man, and, and yeah, that's what you. Guys, probably have you back on again, but. Year 2033. Hey, no, yeah. actually, I'm gonna tell you what. I'm gonna tell you what. I'm getting ready to start my own vehicle, man. Scenario Sports uh, Pod, and we go definitely. We, we and you are definitely gonna rap about about more things than just what we did here today, man. No doubt, man. Guys, thank you so much for having me, man. You know, uh, salute. You know what I'm saying? Let's do it. You know, enjoy your weekend. Stay safe. Stay alive. Stay black. All that. Stay good black stuff. and stay black and don't die. No doubt. <laughs>